Hello and welcome back to Paleocast. My name is Dave Marshall and in this episode I talk about the history of paleontological outreach with Dr Chris Manias of King's College London. I first met Chris at a workshop he was running about paleontological outreach called Popularising Paleontology, for which I'd been invited to talk about our upcoming project, the Virtual Natural History Museum. During that event, lots of topics were discussed, including art, news and specific communications projects, but it was the retelling of the history of paleontological outreach that I found particularly interesting. I therefore invited Chris onto the show to talk about how paleontological sciences have been communicated throughout history and also to reflect on public perceptions of the field today. So, are the public more excited about paleontology now than ever before? Leave us a comment and let us know what you think. And as always, we've got pictures on our website, and if you like and share this interview all over the internet, we'll be eternally grateful. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Hi, Chris. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Right. Now, you are a paleo historian, is that correct? I'm a historian of paleontology. It's probably better, yeah. Mm. Uh, how did you end up uh, getting into that? Um, well, quite a long and um, circular route. I've had a very long and persistent interest in the past, in both the human and the animal past. So growing up, I went to lots of museums, um, natural history museums, archaeology museums and that sort of thing, read lots of history and natural history books, saw lots of history and natural history documentaries and so on. So um, really, I always found these two sort of things went together very well. And then through the well, my secondary school education, I kept studying biology as well as history all the way up till um, I left school. Um, after that, I trained and did my undergrad and postgrad degrees as a historian, mainly because um, I was good at biology, but not quite so good at chemistry and physics and the other sort of science um, subjects, but sort of developed working on um, 19th century history in particular, and the 19th century history of subjects like um, um, anthropology and archaeology and these sorts of ways of excavating the human past. I found that when I was doing my PhD, I, I, the areas of that I was most interested in were um, was a chapter that I wrote on the establishment and the development of um, ideas about human evolution and the Paleolithic, and so how things like um, yeah prehistoric humans were initially asserted to have existed and um, how they were sort of understood within the various different evolutionary frameworks that people had um, in the 19th century. When I went to do um, my various postdocs and my various post-PhD work, then um, one of the first jobs I got was at the University of Bristol, where I was hired to be the um, token history of science person on a big project on um, the history on kind of colonial history of early 20th century China, and so trying to work out a project that I could do within that sort of context. So working out how um, Europeans and Americans were conducting scientific research in China in the early 20th century. And how they were interacting with um, Chinese institutions and Chinese individuals. And I found while I was doing that, that there were a number of really, really huge um, paleontological projects in this time, particularly in the 1920s and the 1930s. So you had the massive exp expeditions by the American Museum of Natural History to Mongolia um, in the 1920s. And you also had the excavations of Peking Man in the 1920s and 1930s. So finding a large number of very, very well-preserved um, Homo erectus specimens just outside of Beijing. So I became very interested in this. And also while I, while I was at Bristol, I noticed that there was one of the largest and one of the most sort of well-established um, paleontology departments in the UK. So while I was developing this um, history of paleontology project, I sat in on the vertebrate paleontology course and sort of, sort of started developing uh, my understanding of the modern subject in that way. And so sort of found these two things together and continued them into my current project, which is a huge um, global history of um, mammal paleontology from the middle of the 19th century up until the middle of the 20th century. So what would a typical day be like for you? 
Well, my main job is being a university lecturer, so that can be quite varied. I'm a university lecturer in a history department, so that involves lots of teaching, and it, the teaching varies between general courses on 19th and 20th century British and European history, all the way up to quite specialist topics on the history of science and the history of evolution. So I do that a great deal in term time, and when I'm not doing that, I spend a lot of time writing, presenting my work at conferences, um, organising workshops, all kinds of different things. But when it comes to your research, how do you go about doing that? Where do you find your data? Um, well, there's lots of data all over the place. Um, obviously, paleontology, as it develops in the 19th and 20th centuries, it has its own institutions, so it has museums and research institutes, and these generated a lot of documents and a lot of material. So particularly things like books, monographs, and journals, which give you a good impression of the kind of finished product and the kind of polished results of the scientific research. As well as that, because paleontology has been such a popular and such a publicly um, widely diffused subject, then there are a lot of um, documents related to that. So things like um, newspapers have lots of reports on paleontological research, um, films occasionally, magazines, and so on. Um, so lots of these are now online. So there are things like the Biodiversity Heritage Library, which is a godsend because it has loads of digitized newspapers and loads of digitized journals and books. But for the more kind of specialist stuff, you do often have, still have to go to the basements of museums and libraries to search out um, lots of um, more obscure material. Um, so I do a lot of work, particularly in museum archives. So looking at unpublished material, which is normally held um, quite often, well, sometimes it can be in quite a a well-organized, quite a well-equipped um, research institute or a research room if it's a large, well-funded um, museum. But quite often the archive will be a sort of section within one particular natural history storeroom or a cupboard in someone's office. And this will contain lots of folders, lots of um, boxes of a whole range of different kinds of materials. So you can find things like expedition notebooks, you can find the letters that paleontologists are writing either from the field to back to their home institution or between each other. You can find lots of ephemeral material as well, so things like unpublished books, books of newspaper clippings. You can sometimes find specially commissioned um, paleo art and specially commissioned sort of illustrations. You can find a surprisingly large number of poems that paleontologists are writing or out, out in the field. Never well, rarely any good, but they're still very, very interesting as a kind of um, an illustration of how the science is, is, is conducted. Yeah, so all, all kinds of stuff. And it's a question of synthesizing quite a lot of material into a sort of um, yeah, image of how the discipline works. I'm going to have to start working on my poems. Although <laughs> I, d I don't think there are many words that rhyme with Eurypterid. Um, possibly Eurypterid. No, I can't think of any offhand. No, <laughs> it's like it's like silver or orange. Uh, Eurypterid <laughs> should be included in that. Words that have <laughs> nothing that rhyme with it. Uh, right. So let's have a look at uh, the history of public engagement with paleontology. So, how visible has the paleontological field been in the public's eye through history? Well, really, when the field gets established in the latter part of the 18th century and the early part of the 19th century, it's very, very closely entangled with public interest, public debate, and new kinds of media engagement with various different forms of science. So if we think about some of the largest, large earliest figures in paleontology. So people like Georges Cuvier in Paris, who's very instrumental at developing the idea of um, extinction and, um, and, and sort of cementing the authority of the main Paris Natural History Museum, or people like William Buckland in the UK then they are, as well as conducting their scientific research, um, engaging in a great deal of lecturing and displaying fossils to quite large and often quite diverse audiences. And this is, um, on the one hand, very important for getting actual recognition and funds and support for the field. Obviously, paleontology doesn't really have much in the way of economic byproducts of its own. And so in order to, for it to justify itself to kind of controlling authorities and to get funds, and it needs to show that it has some sort of wider significance. And so generating support from the public can be a really, really important way of doing that. If we're thinking about the early 19th century as well, in particular, then the interest in paleontology is also part of a much wider 
interest in the world and all the things um, which can be found um, acro across the globe. So this is the period when animals and plants and minerals from all over the different continents are coming into Europe and being connected, collected and being widely commented upon. It's when other cultures are being encountered in a very in-depth way and often being uncolonized. And so you're getting a great deal of knowledge about strange, unknown forms of life, unknown cultures, unknown histories. And within this, interest in the history and origins of life become part of this entire process of curiosity about the world and the world being a much more extensive place than was previously thought about. Was paleontology just uh, for the middle-aged, rich uh, gentlemen scholars of Western countries, uh, or did it manage to uh, bridge some of the socio-economic socio uh, barriers, and did it manage to get uh, all around the world? Um, yeah, um, well, as I kind of mentioned before, if you just look at the published documents and the kind of printed monographs and the printed journals, then the impression you would get would be it is only these um, white, quite elite, um, middle-aged men in control of large collections in sort of great centers of learning like Oxford or Paris or New York and so on. Um, but if you actually start digging around in the um, more ephemeral material, in the sort of more unpublished material, then you find find that there are a whole load of other people involved in scientific and paleontological work who are often written out of these larger narratives. So if we think about how things would just work in a museum by itself, then you have a wide variety of workers. So you have um, technical workers, people in laboratories, um, transforming sort of often quite messy, fragmentary fossils into usable scientific objects. You have um, collectors living in various different parts of the world who are being paid to find materials material and send them to many of these scientists and scholars. So obviously one of the most um, iconic of these is Mary Anning, who was working in the south of England in the first part of the 19th century. But she's one of probably hundreds of um, lower class people and often middle class people as well, who are finding fossils in their local, uh, in their local, in, in, in their local areas and sent either selling them or just sending them out of a sense of kind of obligation or duty to these um, larger uh, these larger figures. As well as that, the people are actually doing the digging. These are quite often manual workers, manual laborers who are just being paid, um, or quite often they're people who are just engaged in excavation and digging projects and who are finding stuff and um, being paid to sell them to scientists. So there are a large number of miners who come up with um, fossils and either coal deposits or limestone deposits in particular. Um, in the American West, there are lots of prospectors who are finding fossils and materials. And if we're thinking about places like um, Australia, Australia or parts of Africa or East Asia, then quite often the indigenous people there will actually know about fossils. They'll know particular localities where you do have exposed fossils and they'll be able to tell um, Western prospectors or Western scientists about them. And so you get this quite interesting interplay between these different ways of thinking about fossils and things within the, 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 the natural world. Do you think we've come a long way into the modern age or are some of the same problems still there? Um, in, in, in what respect? In terms of socioeconomic divides and geographic and it just being for the rich white man. Um, I think it's. I, I think it, it has. It has changed, and it changed quite significantly over over the course of the twentieth century, because um, obviously you do have these um, large, often fairly well funded museums in places like the east coast of the United States or in um, or, or, or or in Western Europe. But then the sort of flip side of that is that there are particular regions outside of Europe and North America where you find very very, very interesting fossils that you can't find anywhere else, obviously. So classic examples of this on a historical basis would be in South America, where in the late 19th and early 20th century, the remains of um, the sort of stranger South American mammals, so things like ground sloths, glyptodonts, toxodonts, and so on, are really, really, really fascinating to scientists everywhere. Or nowadays, obviously, you have um, 
titanosaurs coming out of that sort of area. Or if we think about um, Australia, then the fossil marsupials um, are very, very interesting, very sort of um, evocative for lots of people. And in South Africa, then um, the both um, finds related to human evolution, so australopithecines, but also therapsids um, and the kind of vast um, Permian deposits that you have in the Karoo. These are very, very exciting and very, very interesting to scientists all over the world. And what this does is, on the one hand, scientists in North America and Europe want to organize expeditions to come to these areas and take these fossils and take them back. But it also means that if you're an aspirational paleontologist working in Australia, South Africa, or Argentina, it means you can actually build up your own authority and build up your own control of the sites. And so it becomes a much more diverse geographically sort of discipline than we might initially expect. In the uh, modern era, the public perception of paleontology is that it's, it's primarily focused on uh, dinosaurs. Has that <laughs> always been the case? Um, well, there have been sort of these periodic waves of dinomania where dinosaurs and well, mesozoic reptiles more generally have generated massive public excitement and massive public interest. So you have one of these waves in the um, 1850s where you have the Crystal Palace dinosaurs being um, being displayed. And so that's widely reported in the media in Britain and also a bit further afield. You then, in the period between about the 1880s up until the First World War, have another one of these waves of dinomania where you first start, start getting the skeletons of large American dinosaurs, um, both um, being e exhibited in the United States, but also being exhibited in Europe. And particularly things like sauropods are very, very dramatic, very, very exciting, and do sort of um, re re and sort of alter the way in which people think about life can develop and this, in terms of both the scale and the strangeness of it, really. And then in the latter part of the 20th century, there's, I think there's another one of these waves um, attached to particular, particularly things like Jurassic Park and this and tied to the dinosaur re 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 renaissance, where this new image of dinosaurs as these um, kind of quite dynamic creatures gets presented both in the popular science, but also through a range of media. So there are these kind of updates in interest in dinosaurs. But if we look back into history, then quite often there is a much greater diversity of what is interesting in the paleontological past. In the 19th century, um, and for most of the 19th century, then the Mesozoic period is that it's usually um, relativized. In, <laughs> but it's but it's usually relativized into what's often termed the evolutionary epic. So attempting to present the entire history of life from its origins up until the present as a kind of long dramatic story. So within this, people devote um, as much attention to things like um, yeah, trilobites and early marine invertebrates. They pay a great deal of attention to, um, to Permian material. Um, they're very, very interested in the in the 19th century because this is the period when the Industrial Revolution is really, really taking off and people are very interested in where the coal is coming from. And so this is sort of tying into kind of broader scientific interest in that. And people are also very, very interested in fossil mammals, both as um, a set of um, as, as, as a set of organisms for whom there are quite um, quite extensive fossil remains, and also the creatures which can potentially explain um, the origin of quite familiar animals to, to to the present. So things like horses, elephants, um, cats, and so on. So sorry about the uh, cutting out in there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we we have fixed that now, hopefully. Okay. Um, so, what have been some of the hot topics or uh, areas of research throughout the history of the subject? Have there been any kind of like burning questions that needed to be answered? Um, well, there have been yeah, various ones throughout the history of the discipline. Um, they orientate around different um, sets of questions and di different sets of problems. So, um, in the 19th century, then, one of the biggest things that people are interested in is just reconstructing the history of life as a kind of single narrative, as a way of um, working out, um, just like humans have a history, how the Earth has a history, and how different um, organisms have changed and developed through time. And this, on the one hand, is quite important for the public presentation of the field, because it's a way of kind of explaining it to public audiences in a quite easily graspable way. But it also leads to new ideas about um, taxonomy, 
and how you actually order and how you actually organize the natural world. And it leads to this idea that you should base um, taxonomy not just around comparative anatomy or morphological similarities, but around what is unrelated to what and around ideas of ancestry and phylogeny. So that's a very, very important set of developments. Within this, there's also been a consistent look and a consistent search for the origins of particular types and particular um, groups. So this could either be the origin of life itself, which is always a kind of quite burning issue for the past um, 200 years, really. Um, the origin of vertebrates is something that um, generates a lot of interest, um, particularly at the turn of the 20th century, and this then carries on up till the present. Um, the origin of tetrapods and how life um, and how sort of vertebrate life came onto land is another thing which, um, which, which excites a lot of attention. Um, the origin of mammals and birds, the origin of humans, these have all been major sources of both um, giving an easily graspable hook to um, public presentations, but also for sort of solving particular mysteries in the development and in the sort of origin of life. And then, um, as well as this, there have also been these periodic drives um, specifically to find quite dramatic and quite spectacular creatures. So in the um, early part of the 19th century, people are very, very interested in finding um, ground sloth specimens. These are um, taken as being a very, very strange and a very, very dramatic sort of um, form. So you have lots of people going to South America looking for the remains of ground sloths or also um, making casts of them and exchanging them between different museums. Um, so that's one sort of thing which generates a lot of interest. And then in the, from the late 19th century onward, then, then there's quite a similar drive to find big sauropods or big dramatic um, theropods, which is sort of on the one which is primarily drawing on a sense of national of of competition between different institutions so who can have the best mounted sauropod and a way of sort of drawing in the crowds and drawing in the public interest would i be guilty of always looking at the past through a lens of uh, darwinian evolution uh, has that always been accepted and have there ever been any alternatives uh, or dead ends in terms of uh, hypotheses of how things evolved that were extensively explored at the time um, yeah, well, the, the first very interesting thing, which I normally bring up with this, is that the origins of paleontology and the idea that life has this long-term durational history is a pre-Darwinian development. It really starts coming in in the 1780s, 1790s, and really explodes into the public arena in the first decades of the 19th century. So by the time Darwin publishes The Origin in 1859, this is already quite well established, and paleontologists have and have had had quite widely accepted this idea that there is this sort of not necessarily evolutionary but kind of developmental history of life that needs to be understood as, as having occurred across a very 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 long time scale so if we're thinking about big changes in the way in which people engage with nature and engage with the natural world then this um, establishment of a paleontological past i think is almost as or possibly as big a bigger break in people's conceptions as darwinian evolution now this kind of longer term basis of it means that when Darwinian evolution comes along in the middle of the 19th century, paleontologists are very interested in it, but they're still often quite um, quite adamant that paleontology has its own ways of looking at things and has its own sort of independent authority. So they're quite willing to say that Darwin and his works are huge and transformative, but very often they're unwilling to say that natural selection is the only force at work or the most significant force at work. And partly this is down to scientific factors. So paleontologists and geologists in this period are working with an age of the Earth, which is still millions of years old, but it's nowhere near long enough for the kind of processes that Darwin is talking about to actually lead to the whole diversity of life. They're normally dealing with an Earth, which is about 100 billion years um, old in its entirety, and a history of life, which is 20 to 30 million years old. So this means that in order to explain the diversity of life, they need to bring in very dramatic and very sort of fast moving ways of thinking about evolution, which are quite often based around ideas of progress, around ideas of organisms having their own sort of life force, so sort of growing like individual organisms do, um, and very sort of interested in sort of the, uh, in, in kind of more Lamarckian ways of thinking about heredity and thinking about um, the, the ch change, change, change within organisms. So quite often they are leading into these ideas 
idea is that evolution is both progressive and quite fast. And that's partly because of the material they're looking at. And it's partly because in order for Darwinian evolution to be widely accepted, you need a large number of other scientific developments to come in, which actually fill in the gaps within, within, within his theory. So how did it become accepted? Was it that the paleontologists eventually realised that this is applicable? Or did the two fields, uh, paleontology and biology, kind of merge? Um, this is something that is still being debated quite a lot in the history of paleontology. There was a stereotype in some of the old literature that um, in the early part, well, really through most of the 20th century, paleontology was cast off from the other life sciences and looked on as not having a place at the sort of high table of science. So being a sort of um, junior science, which wasn't as respectable as things like um, genetics or, zo or zoology and so on. Um, and so that's one of the things which has been presented in some of the older literature. I don't quite agree with that because I think that paleontology throughout the 20th century was still quite theoretically innovative and led to quite a lot of different ideas. But in, ter in terms of the sort of shifts within the discipline, on the one hand, um, you have the old authorities who are very, very strongly committed to these very progressive, very sort of directional ideas of evolution. They start dying or they start losing their positions in the 1930s and 1940s. And so when you have a new generation come in, then they're more willing to to sort of um, to come to, to to engage with these less directional concepts, um, but it also has to do with um, changes in other fields of science. So it has to do with um, genetics really being widely accepted as a way of explaining heredity, um, which is a huge development in the first part of the 20th century, and it comes from new ideas about the age of the Earth. So radiometric dating becomes um, well, it's established quite early in the 20th century, but it's only really accepted in geology in the 1920s and 1930s, and this gives the timescale which is required for Darwinian concepts to really sort of make sense and really be justifiable. So what have been some of the greatest paleontological outreach uh, projects throughout history? Um, well, I think the largest one um, is, is almost hiding in plain sight, which is the construction of natural history museums which um, originate um, throughout the 19th century and particularly in the latter part of the 19th century as both um, scientific research institutes where you collect and organize and study large, large amounts of material which are um, coming both from particular localities but also coming from all over the world, but also being public institutions where people go to um, learn about um, particular aspects of science, to hear lectures, to see exhibits, to see the specimens and to get a wider interest in um, science through that way. And within natural history museums, then they've obviously always had large numbers of different departments but um, there's always really from the middle of the 19th century been a view that in order to really, really excite the public about the natural world, then one of the most effective ways of doing that is to have large, dramatic mounted skeletons of usually fossil vertebrates and sort of dramatic reconstructions of what, of what these things would have been like in life. And so this is a sort of major driving force within that. Do you ever come across any particularly interesting opinions or reactions to any kind of past paleontological event? Like, has someone written in their diary, like, oh, I've been having a terrible time with tuberculosis, but I did see a giant skeleton being moved into the Natural History Museum and it was fabulous? Um, yeah, there have been a couple. One of the things I'm quite interested in is the history of therapsid research in South Africa, and, um, and particularly in the career of Robert Broom, who was one of the leading experts in, 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 in therapsids in the early part of the 20th century. And the way in which he collected large numbers of his specimens was by um, sort of um, getting into contact with local farmers and local prospectors who would often have um, therapsids specimens just sort of weathering out on their land amongst their kind of sheep farming areas. And so he'd write a large number of letters um, to people or to, to farmers all over South Africa trying to um, find where, where, where these things were. And the way in which he'd get people interested in sending him his spe their, their specimens and allowing him to prospect on their land was by explaining that these were creatures which were hundreds of millions of years old. They show the transition from reptile to mammal and they give um, research 
research in this region a particular um, sort of wide significance. And people do write back in a large in, 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 la in large sorts of numbers, so very, very excited about this idea and sending him their specimens and really, really becoming sort of involved within the practice of scientific research through this. Uh, what does the understanding of the public perceptions of paleontology in the past tell us about that time? Um, I think it's important because paleontology often involves a very big um, historical perspective. Um, so it's very interesting to see um, to use an, as an example or as an entry point into how people more generally understand the world and its development, how they understand nature and how they understand humanity's place within it. Because when people are engaging with paleontology, on the one hand, they are sort of very often seeking to be um, in awe of spectacular creatures in the past, but they're also sort of often thinking about much bigger questions of how do humans fit in with the natural world? How can we actually know the past of the earth and the particular organisms why should we listen to scientists about this why do scientists have the authority to kind of reconstruct and present these creatures and where did current animals current nature come from and how has it changed over time so it's engaging with these much bigger much broader sorts of questions and issues and in turn how can the study of engagement in the past be useful to us today um, I think there are two kind of quite large things. One's a sort of potentially a negative point and one's a more positive point. Um, on the one hand, I think in terms of a lot of the stereotypes and the sort of structures around the way that paleontology gets discussed and that we might want to move away from um, in current outreach or current broader discussion, um, many of these do have a historical origin. So if we want to find out where these ideas come from. So this question, this sort of idea of um, not just paleontology just being about dinosaurs, but about, dinos about this particular image of dinosaurs as these snarling monsters with more sort of in common with kind of mythological creatures or dragons than with living animals. And this is an idea that you kind of see in a lot of the more kind of, um, yeah, sensationalist paleontological popularization today. But this has its roots in certain 19th century presentations where you do get particular ideas um, of, um, or, or literal um, sort of presentations of dinosaurs being called dragons or monsters or grotesque creatures. And so it's coming out of this deeper sort of tradition. Um, and in terms of the kind of image of the discipline, then the tying in with the sort of stuff we we were talking about about paleontology having this um, this stereotypical image of being quite a white male European um, discipline. This again does potentially come from these late 19th and early 20th century ways of presenting and ways of discussing paleontology, where it's often presented as a field or a subject which is being conducted by a particular kind of almost sort of hyper masculine sort of scientist who in the US context would go out to the badlands in his cowboy hat with his gun and kind of engage with the um, with the fossil material, but also sort of get, get involved in all sorts of adventures and all kinds of um, dramatic kind of pulp, 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 pulp action kind of encounters. And so I think that if we want to sort of, um, yeah, diversify the image of paleontology within the public arena, then I think... Um, realizing that that is a historical product and it's just one historical sort of set of images and set of associations around paleontology but there have but there have been these much broader and these much wider engagements with it all through its history i think that's quite um, important and leading on from that i think the kind of more positive thing around this is this question of kind of who does science and where is science done and the history of paleontology has i think been one where science and public ideas have been very deeply and almost necessarily entwined and while we don't necessarily want to completely emulate historical ways of promoting paleontological ideas it does show that the subject is kind of quite inseparable from wider cultural debates and wider concerns I bet you've written that a hundred times in grant applications. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I first met you in an event that you were running called Popularising Paleontology. Can you tell us about that project, please? Oh, yeah, sure. Well, um, this really came out of my dual interests in that 
Um, in the history of science and in humanities and social science fields more generally, then the study of popular science and how popular science actually works is a huge area leading to lots of interesting and sort of um, dynamic ideas. And within this, then people studying both the history, but also the current cultural emplacement of deep time and paleontological sciences has been a major field within this. And so that's my kind of initial research basis. But then as I was keeping up to speed and getting into developments within paleontology itself, I noticed that there was both a huge amount of paleontological outreach going on, which often had a very reflexive and a very sophisticated um, take on the perspective of um, this sort of dynamic about science in public, and also a great deal of interest in the relationships between the science, but also its history, and also its more artistic dimensions, so particularly through things like paleoart and so on. So we had these complementary developments, but they weren't actually talking to one another, which I thought was a potential problem. So what I went about doing was organizing um, a series of workshops, um, in initially just two, um, at, the work, at, at my university, um, which is King's College London, to get a group of people together to discuss and see how much common discussion there could be between these um, often separated areas of the more scientific community and the more kind of humanities, social science community. So, um, yeah, the main aims of this were to, yeah, to overcome these different barriers between the arts, humanities and, and the sciences, which um, paleontology, I think, is very well suited to doing because it is a subject where quite often there is a large engagement with history and art and various forms of sort of um, and, and various different creative fields. Um, beyond that, I wanted people to think kind of quite reflexively about the prospect and about the areas of um, popularization and the public dimension of paleontology. So not just in the general, isn't popularizing paleontology great? Isn't it great that paleontolo pale paleontological stories are in the news all the time? But also what can be some of the risks involved in this process of making paleontology a popular science? Can, does this potentially affect the, the reputation of the discipline or does it potentially affect the directions that research takes? And finally, I wanted to think about how paleontology gets entangled in big debates over large issues, whether this is ideas about progress and humanity um, in the past, or whether it's about these more longer running and still persistent concerns over evolution, over the place of science in society, over biodiversity and um, conservation. So the initial workshop, I think, was very successful and actually did work in getting people from different disciplines talking to one another, which I think is quite is, is quite good. And we had a general agreement, I think, that um, if you want to understand the public role of paleontology, we need to have a multidisciplinary perspective. We need to have we need to have working paleontologists talking to artists, talking to museum professionals, talking to historians, talking to English literature people, talking to science communicators, science communicators journalists and so on. And also that if we're talking about the place of paleontology within the public arena, it should be about more than snarling dinosaurs. And historically, there has been a much richer and a much more sort of multivalent discussion um, and use and engagement with paleontological ideas. And I think that in terms of both current scientific interest and also popular interest and popular sort of demand, there is, I think, a great deal of opportunity to diversify the, 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 the debate in the ways of presenting here. So beyond that, um, I've now got a grant from the UK Arts and Humanities Research Council and can hold some more events in 2018, 2019. So there'll be two more in London. We've just held one in Amsterdam and there'll be another one in Raleigh in North Carolina. And what we want to do is to make this um, network as publicly accessible as possible. So all the talks are being recorded and uploaded to the workshop website. And um, we're also gonna be having public engagement events attached to the different workshops. So things like art exhibitions, discussion, pa dis discussion panels, film screenings, and so on. So that's something to look out for in the future. Okay, you've basically answered all the questions that I had written about popularizing paleontology. <laughs> so uh, very efficient. Um, so just to summarize then, uh, how is history currently being made in paleontological outreach? So what are some of the most engaging projects currently out there? 
Um, I think that um, paleontology is obviously very prominent in the media, and I think in the wider media, paleontology, um, despite its relatively low budget in comparison to other sciences, is probably um, the most prominent of all the different sciences. Maybe astrophysics or maybe certain kinds of genetics might be um, more prominent in kind of journalistic discussion, but every week almost there is a new sort of dinosaur or fossil discovery that gets presented in um, quite dramatic terms within um, public debate. So just the extent is really kind of quite dramatic and quite surprising. Within that, in terms of um, more innovative things which you're doing, I think, or, or, or being done, I think the way that um, paleontological outreach gets connected with new technologies is really interesting. So obviously podcasting and things like paleocast and so on are really, really interesting. Um, also new kinds of um, sort of electronic and CG ways of um, presenting um, and reconstructing the life of the past are very, very interesting. So things like the show Dinosaurs in the Wild that's currently running um, all over the country or computer games like Saurian. So this is a kind of diversification into new forms of media. Um, also, I think that the way that paleo art is developing um, is really, really interesting. So the whole movement coming out of All Yesterdays and also work by people like Mark Whitten, Beth Windle, Bob Nichols and so on, who are both attempting to present paleo art and develop it as being both as scientifically rigorous as possible, but also making sense as art as well. I think that's a really, really exciting development within um, the wider place of science within society. And finally, I think the way that the there are various projects attempting to shift the image of paleontology in the public is quite important. So I think the um, trailblazers, for example, this attempt to recover um, the work of um, women involved in paleontology and also archaeology and anthropology is a really, really exciting and a really, really important um, development. So what do you see for the future of paleontological outreach? Uh, well, historians are always very wary about predicting the future because we look into the past and we see people making predictions which are usually really, really poor and usually just about extrapolating trends that they find significant about the present and missing things which are the major shifts that we now recognise. So predicting the future as a historian is, is a bit tricky. But in terms of what I think is possibly likely to happen, then I think that there'll be continuing um, tying, tying in with, with, between paleontological science and new technology and new forms of media. And with paleontology and particularly paleontological reconstructions of fossil organisms, providing a really, really interesting test case of um, using media to sort of creatively engage with scientific work. Um, another thing which I think is probably going to happen is um, paleontological outreach is likely, I think, to become more urgent and more sort of significant and as concerns around things like environmental and climatic change, as the biodiversity crisis that we're living through, and as the kind of unusual influence of humans on the natural world is being sort of increasingly prominent within the media and wider discussion, then I think that reflections on the past history of life um, really can't help but tie in with this and be an important part of the wider debate. Okay, Chris, that's been absolutely fascinating. Uh, thanks so much for coming on the show. Okay, thanks for inviting me. Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall with Joe Keating, Laura Sol, Liz Martin Silverstone, and Caitlin Colary. It was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association, but the show now relies on contributions from you, the listeners. If you've liked this episode, please consider donating, and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. We'd also like to thank the Ocean Collective for use of their music. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programmes. Subscribe to our Twitter feed at Paleocast, and like us at facebook.com forward slash paleocast to get all the latest news.